Section thirty, part one of chapter eight of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone, Book One, Chapter Eight, Part One, Chapter the Eighth, of the King's Revenue. Having, in the preceding chapter, considered at large those branches of the king's prerogative which contribute to his royal dignity, and constitute the executive power of the government, we proceed now to examine the king's fiscal prerogatives, or such as regard his revenue, which the British Constitution hath vested in the royal person, in order to support his dignity and maintain his power, being a portion which each subject contributes of his property, in order to secure the remainder. This revenue is either ordinary or extraordinary. The king's ordinary revenue is such as has either subsisted time out of mind in the crown, or else has been granted by Parliament, by way of purchase or exchange for such of the king's inherent hereditary revenues as were found inconvenient to the subject. When I say that it has subsisted time out of mind in the crown, I do not mean that the king is at present in the actual possession of the whole of this revenue. Much, nay, the greatest part of it, is at this day in the hands of subjects, to whom it has been granted, out from time to time by the kings of England, which has rendered the crown in some measure dependent on the people for its ordinary support and subsistence. So that I must be obliged to recount, as part of the royal revenue, what lords of manners and other subjects frequently look upon to be their own absolute rights, because they are, and have been vested in them and their ancestors for ages, though in reality originally derived from the grants of our ancient princes. 1. The first of the king's ordinary revenues, which I shall take notice of, is of an ecclesiastical kind, as are also the three succeeding ones, viz. the custody of the temporalities of the bishops, by which are meant all the lay revenues, lands, and tenements, in which is included his barony, which belong to an archbishop's or bishop's see and these upon the vacancy of the bishopric are immediately the right of the king, as a consequence of his prerogative in church matters, whereby he is considered as the founder of all archbishoprics and bishoprics, to whom, during the vacancy, they revert. And for the same reason, before the dissolution of abbeys, the king had the custody of the temporalities of all such abbeys and priories, as were of royal foundation, but not of those founded by subjects, on the death of the abbot or prior. Another reason may also be given, why the policy of the law hath vested this custody in the king, because, as the successor is not known, the lands and possessions of the sea would be liable to spoil and devastation, if no one had a property therein. Therefore the law has given the king, not the temporalities themselves, but the custody of the temporalities, till such time as a successor is appointed, with power of taking to himself all the immediate profits, without any account to the successor, and with the right of presenting, which the crown very frequently exercises, to such benefices and other preferments as fall within the time of vacation. This revenue is of so high a nature that it could not be granted out to a subject, before or even after it accrued. But now, by the statute 14th Edward III, statute 4, c. 4 and 5, the king may, after the vacancy, lease the temporalities to the dean and chapter saving to himself of all avowsons, escheats, and the like. Our ancient kings, and particularly William Rufus, were not only remarkable for keeping the bishoprics a long time vacant, for the sake of enjoying the temporalities, but also committed to horrible waste on the woods and other parts of the estate, and to crown all, would never, when the sea was filled up, restore to the bishop his temporalities again, unless he purchased them at an exorbitant price. To remedy which, King Henry I granted a charter at the beginning of his reign, promising neither to sell, nor let to farm, nor take anything from the domains of the church, till the successor was installed. And it was made one of the articles of the great charter, that no waste should be committed in the temporalities of bishoprics, neither should the custody of them be sold. The same is ordained by the statute of Westminster I, and the statute 14th Edward III, statute 4 c. 4, which permits, as we have seen, a lease to the dean and chapter, is still more explicit in prohibiting the other exactions. It was also a frequent abuse, that the king would, for trifling, or no causes, 
seized the temporalities of bishops even during their lives into his own hands but this is guarded against by statute first edward the third statute two c two this revenue of the king which was formerly very considerable is now by a customary indulgence almost reduced to nothing for at present as soon as the new bishop is consecrated and confirmed he usually receives the restitution of his temporalities quite entire and untouched from the king and then and not sooner he has a fee simple in his bishopric and may maintain an action for the same two the king is entitled to a cority as the law calls it out of every bishopric that is to send one of his chaplains to be maintained by the bishop or to have a pension allowed him till the bishop promotes him to a benefice. This is also in the nature of an acknowledgment to the king, as founder of the see, since he had formerly the same cority or pension from every abbey or priory of royal foundation. It is, I apprehend, now fallen into total disuse, though Sir Matthew Hale says that it is due of common right, and that no prescription will discharge it. 3. The king, as was formerly observed, is entitled to all the tithes arising in extra-parochial places, though perhaps it may be doubted how far this article, as well as the last, can be properly reckoned a part of the king's own royal revenue, since a cority supports only his chaplains, and these extra-parochial tithes are held under an implied trust, that the king will distribute them for the good of the clergy in general. 4. The next branch consists in the first fruits and tenths of all spiritual preferments in the kingdom, both of which I shall consider together. These were originally a part of the papal usurpations over the clergy of this kingdom, first introduced by Pandulf the Pope's legate during the reigns of King John and Henry the Third in the See of Norwich, and afterwards attempted to be made universal by the Popes Clement V and John the Twenty Second, about the beginning of the fourteenth century. The first fruits, primice or annates, were the first year's whole profits of the spiritual preferment, according to a rate or valour made under the direction of Pope Innocent IV by Walter, Bishop of Norwich, in thirty-eighth Henry the Third, and afterwards advanced in value by commission from Pope Nicholas the Third, A.D. twelve ninety-two, twentieth Edward I, which valuation in Pope Nicholas is still preserved in the Exchequer. The tenths or decime were the tenth part of the annual profit of each living by the same valuation, which was also claimed by the Holy See, under no better pretense than a strange misapplication of that principle of the Levitical law, which directs that the Levites should offer the tenth part of their tithe as a heave offering to the Lord, and give it to Aaron the high priest. But this claim of the Pope met with vigorous resistance from the English Parliament, and a variety of acts were passed to prevent and restrain it particularly the statute, 6th Henry the Fourth, C. 1, which calls it a horrible mischief and damnable custom. But the popish clergy, blindly devoted to the will of a foreign master, still kept it on foot, sometimes more secretly, sometimes more openly and avowedly, so that in the reign of Henry the Eighth, it was computed that in the compass of fifty years, eight hundred thousand ducats had been sent to Rome for first fruits only and as the clergy expressed this willingness to contribute so much of their income to the head of the church, it was thought proper, when in the same reign the papal power was abolished, and the king was declared the head of the church in England, to annex this revenue to the crown, which was done by the statute 26 Henry the Eighth C. 1, confirmed by the statute 1st Elizabeth C. 4, and a new valor beneficiorum was made, by which the clergy are at present rated. By these last-mentioned statutes all vicarages under ten pounds a year, and all rectories under ten marks, are discharged from the payment of first-fruits. And if, in such livings as continue chargeable with this payment, the incumbent lives but half a year, he shall pay only one quarter of his first-fruits. But if one whole year, then half of them, if a year and a half, three quarters, and if two years, then the whole, and not otherwise. Likewise, by the statute 27th Henry the Eighth, C. 8, no tenths are to be paid for the first year, for then the first-fruits are due, and by other statutes of Queen Anne, in the fifth and sixth years of her reign, if a benefice be under fifty pounds per annum clear yearly value, it shall be discharge of the payment of first-fruits and tenths. Thus the richer clergy, being by the criminal bigotry of their popish predecessors, subjected at first to a foreign exaction, were afterwards, when that yoke was shaken off, liable to a like misapplication of their revenues, 
through the rapacious disposition of the then reigning monarch, till at length the piety of Queen Anne restored to the church what had been thus indirectly taken from it. This she did, not by remitting the tenths and first fruits entirely, but in a spirit of truest equity, by applying these superfluities of the larger benefices to make up the deficiencies of the smaller. And to this end she granted her royal charter, which was confirmed by the statute second and c eleven, whereby all the revenue of first fruits and tenths is vested in trustees for ever, to form a perpetual fund for the augmentation of poor livings. This is usually called Queen Anne's Bounty, which has been still farther regulated by subsequent statutes, too numerous here to recite. five. The next branch of the king's ordinary revenue, which, as well as the subsequent branches, is of a lay or temporal nature, consists in the rents and profits of the desmond lands of the crown. These demesne lands, terre dominicalis regis, being either the share reserved to the crown at the original distribution of landed property, or such as came to it afterwards by forfeitures or other means, were anciently very large and extensive, comprising diverse manors, honours, and lordships the tenants of which had very peculiar privileges, as will be shown in the second book of these commentaries, when we speak of the tenure in ancient Demesen. At present they are contracted within a very narrow compass, having been almost entirely granted away to private subjects. This has occasioned the Parliament frequently to interpose, and particularly, after King William the Third had greatly impoverished the Crown, an act passed whereby all future grants or leases from the Crown, for any longer term than thirty-one years or three lives are to be declared void, except with regard to houses, which may be granted for fifty years. And no reversionary lease can be made, so as to exceed, together with the estate in being, the same term of three lives or thirty-one years, that is, where there is a subsisting lease, of which there are twenty years still to come, the king cannot grant a future interest to commence after the expiration of the former, for any longer term than eleven years. The tenant must also be made liable to be punished for committing waste, and the usual rent must be reserved, or, where there has usually been no rent, one-third of the clear yearly value. The misfortune is that this act was made too late, after almost every valuable possession of the crown had been granted away for ever, or else upon very long leases, but may be of benefit to posterity when those leases come to expire. 6. Hither might have been referred the advantages which were used to arise to the king from the profits of his military tenures, to which most lands in the kingdom were subject, till the statute 12th Charles the Second, c. 24, which in great measure abolished them all, the explication of the nature of which tenures must be referred to the second book of these commentaries. Hither also might have been referred the profitable prerogative of purveyance and preemption, which was a right enjoyed by the crown of buying up provisions and other necessaries, by the intervention of the king's purveyors, for the use of his royal household, at an appraised valuation, in preference to all others, and even without consent of the owner, and also of forcibly impressing the carriages and horses of the subject, to do the king's business on the public roads, in the conveyance of timber, baggage, and the like, however inconvenient to the proprietor, upon paying him a settled price." a prerogative which prevailed pretty generally throughout Europe, during the scarcity of gold and silver, and the high valuation of money consequential thereupon. In those early times the king's household, as well as those of inferior lords, were supported by specific renders of corn, and other victuals, from the tenants of the respective demesnes, and there was also a continual market kept at the palace gate to furnish viands for the royal use and this answered all purposes, in those ages of simplicity, so long as the king's court continued in any certain place. But when it removed from one part of the kingdom to another, as was formerly very frequently done, it was found necessary to send purveyors beforehand, to get together a sufficient quantity of provisions and other necessaries for the household, and lest the usual demand should raise them to an exorbitant price, the powers before mentioned were vested in the purveyors who, in process of time, very greatly abused their authority, and became a great oppression to the subject, though of little advantage to the crown. Ready money in an open market, when royal residence was more permanent, and specie began to be plenty, being found upon experience to be the best preveditor of any. Wherefore, by degrees, the power of purveyors have declined, in foreign countries as well as our own, 
and particularly were abolished in Sweden by Gustavus Adolphus, toward the beginning of the last century. And, with us in England, having fallen into disuse during the suspension of monarchy, King Charles, at his restoration, consented, by the same statute, to resign entirely those branches of his revenue and power, for the ease and convenience of his subjects, and the Parliament, in part of recompense, settled on him, his heirs and successors for ever, the hereditary excise of fifteen pence per barrel on all beer and ale sold in the kingdom, and a proportionable sum for certain other liquors. So that this hereditary excise, the nature of which shall be farther explained in the subsequent part of this chapter, now forms the sixth branch of His Majesty's ordinary revenue. 7. A seventh branch might also be computed to have arisen from wine licenses, or the rents payable to the Crown by such persons as are licensed to sell wine by retail throughout England, except in a few privileged places. These were first settled on the Crown by the statute 12th Charles II, c. 25, and together with the hereditary excise, made up the equivalent in value for the loss sustained by the prerogative in the abolition of the military tenures, and the right of preemption and purveyance. But this revenue was abolished by the statute 30th George II, c. 19, and an annual sum of upwards of seven thousand pounds per annum, issuing out of the new stamp duties imposed on wine licenses, was settled on the crown in its stead. 8. An eighth branch of the king's ordinary revenue is usually reckoned to consist in the profits arising from his forests. Forests are waste grounds belonging to the king, replenished with all manner of beasts of chase or vineyard, which are under the king's protection, for the sake of his royal recreation and delight, and to that end, and for the preservation of the king's game, there are particular laws, privileges, courts, and officers belonging to the king's forests, all of which will be in their turn explained in the subsequent books of these commentaries. What we are now to consider are only the profits arising to the king from hence, which consist principally in immersements or fines levied for offences against the forest laws. But as few, if any, courts of this kind for levying immersements have been held since 1632, Eighth Charles I, and as from the accounts given of the proceedings in that court by our histories and law-books, nobody would now wish to see them again revived, it is needless, at least in this place, to pursue this inquiry any farther. 9. The profits arising from the king's ordinary courts of justice make a ninth branch of his revenue, and these consist not only in fines imposed upon offenders, forfeitures of recognizances, and immersements levied upon defaulters, but also in certain fees due to the crown in a variety of legal matters, as for setting the great seal to charters, original writs, and other legal proceedings, and for permitting fines to be levied of lands in order to bar entails, or otherwise to ensure their title. As none of these can be done without the immediate intervention of the king, by himself or his officers, the law allows him certain perquisites and profits, as a recompense for the trouble he undertakes for the public. These, in process of time, have been almost all granted out to private persons, or else appropriated to certain particular uses, so that, though our law proceedings are still loaded with their payment, very little of them is now returned into the King's Exchequer, for a part of the whole royal maintenance they were originally intended. All future grants of them, however, by the statute 1st Anne, St. 2, C. 7, are to endure for no longer time than the Prince's life who grants them. 10. A tenth branch of the king's ordinary revenue, said to be grounded on the consideration of his guarding and protecting the seas from pirates and robbers, is the right to royal fish, which are whale and sturgeon, and these, when either thrown ashore or caught near the coasts, are the property of the king, on account of their superior excellence. Indeed, our ancestors seem to have entertained a very high notion of the importance of this right, it being the prerogative of the kings of Denmark and the dukes of Normandy, and from one of these it was probably derived to our princes. It is expressly claimed and allowed in the statute de prerogativa regis, and the most ancient treatises of law now extant make mention of it, though they seem to have made a distinction between whale and sturgeon, as was incidentally observed in a former chapter. End of section 30